don't know where you put it. I don't know either. Everybody, welcome back to another video. This video is yet another of the state recipe series that I am doing of trying to cook a different meal for every one of the 50 states. Today we are tackling another five states and in this video we have Nebraska, Kansas, Maryland, Colorado, and New York. All of the recipes that I am following and all of the websites that I got the history for all of these meals will be in the description box below if you are interested, along with any of the states that I have not cooked for yet. So if you see a state listed in the description and you have a really good suggestion for a meal that is really well known in that state, please leave it in the comments below. But jumping right into it, the first state we are tackling today is Nebraska and we are cooking Reuben sandwiches. For Nebraska, we are making Reuben sandwiches. And I had gone back and forth about if I wanted to actually do Reubens for Nebraska because it was a recipe that Dan and I were already familiar with. And I finally decided yes to do Reuben sandwiches for Nebraska because everywhere I looked online, every single source had Reubens listed as a Nebraska food. So I thought, okay, fine. We'll do Rubens. But instead of just going to the store and buying slices of corned beef already cooked, I have a corned beef brisket here that I got at the store and we are going to slow cook it and cook it ourselves and then in eight hours assemble the sandwich. So I've done this recipe one other time and it is delicious. So I'm very excited to make it again for a state recipe. All you have to do for this part of it is you take the corned beef, you're going to put it in the slow cooker pot that I've got here. Say hello. You're going to pour the little packet of seasoning that comes with it in there. You're going to fill the pot with enough water to just cover the corned beef by about an inch. And then you're gonna add a fourth a cup of peppercorns, two bay leaves, and an entire head of garlic separated and peeled. And then you put it on low for eight hours and let it do its thing. So we're gonna do that and then I'll catch up to you guys in eight hours. Welcome back, it's eight hours later. So now we have the Reuben, and by Reuben I mean corned beef all cooling on this rack. There's all of the peppercorns and then you can see how hot it still is. But now we are going to shred this guy and assemble the sandwiches and it's that simple. And then, then we're gonna toast it on the griddle to get it nice and warm and then that's it. And for a Reuben, it's, they're very simple to put together. All you need is rye bread, the corned beef, Russian dressing, sauerkraut, and Swiss cheese. And it's like I said, it's very simple to put together. One origin story for the Reuben sandwich was that it was created by Jewish Lithuanian born Reuben Kulikovsky in Omaha, Nebraska. It was thought to have been created during a weekly poker game at the Blackstone Hotel in Omaha, in which the hotel's owner, Charles Schimmel, attended. Charles started serving the sandwich on his hotel's lunch menu and later gained national attention when a former employee of the hotel won a national contest with the recipe. Listen to that. We used store-bought sauerkraut. I have made sauerkraut from scratch in the past and I think I've been wanting to do it again, but I didn't take the time to do it for this meal but I do know homemade sauerkraut is very, very good. So I would have made homemade sauerkraut if I had thought of it in advance enough, which I did not because it takes a while to make. such a good flavor to it too and it's so juicy mm. and the crispiness on the bread mm. so good 10 out of 10 recommend 
I agree with what Julie said. So moving just a little bit over, we have our next state, which is Kansas, and we are making beer rocks. For Kansas, we are making beer rocks, I think is how it's pronounced. I haven't actually Googled it to make sure I'm correct in that pronunciation, but I think that's right. And making them, it's very similar to when we made the pasties for Michigan. With Michigan, it was stuffed with meat and potatoes. This time, it is going to be stuffed with beef and cabbage. For the dough part of it, I'm getting ready to work on that now. And this is a different way of making dough again. So I make bread fairly often, but I use, I make bread kind of the same way every time. This recipe called to mix the active dry yeast in with the flour and not activate it first. I, I did that, it's in this bowl with flour right now. Then it also says, instead of using water, we're using milk. We're supposed to warm up the milk, butter, salt, and sugar in a pan, just until it's warm and the butter is mostly melted, and then we add it to that. Never done that before, so I'll be very curious to see how this goes, and then I have to add more flour to it later, and eggs. Dough is risen, so it looks like this. Very nice, very nice. And the filling is also done. I just did all of that off camera. It is just hamburger and cabbage with some onion mixed together and seasoned with a little salt pepper and a tiny bit of cayenne pepper. It smells amazing. I'm very happy with how it smells and I'm hoping it tastes equally as well as it smells. But now what we have to do is roll out all of the dough, cut it into squares, fill each square, and then let it rise for another half an hour before we bake it for a half an hour. Beer rocks were created in Eastern Europe by wives who wanted their husbands to have a hearty, portable meal while they worked in the fields. The dish's popularity spread, and in the 1870s, when German-Russian Mennonites came to the United States, they brought beer rocks with them. While a lot of the immigrants settled in Kansas, others went to Nebraska, where the beer rock morphed into what is called the runza there, which is very similar, but can also include ingredients like cheese. It's, you got a pretty thick top. Yeah. It? So, okay, I want to take a bite like this out of it. That's pretty good. It's good. The pastry is really good. Mm -hmm. I wish there was a way we could have gotten more filling into them, mm -hmm. but it's it's tasty. Mm -hmm. I also feel like there was a way we could have something to dip in. Mm -hmm. I feel like something like this would pair really nicely with a soup. Yes. Now that I think about it. Agreed. Agreed. To make these and then have a simple soup of sorts. Mm -hmm. Overall, it's good. Yeah. yeah. Very good. I realized we didn't actually give very much detail about the flavors. We just said it was good. The dough itself is really nice. It's not dense and it has a sweet flavor to it, which helps contrast the almost bland, simple flavors of the cabbage and beef, which this is a very, very basic pastry, which true to the nature of its origin, had to be something very, very simple. I think it might be able to be enhanced and tweaked some, adding some more seasonings to the beef and cabbage. So there's that little extra spice in there, not necessarily spice, like spicy, but spice as in other flavors thrown in. But overall it is really good. I think if we were to make it again and have this with a soup, I would want to leave the flavors as they are, really, really simple, and then let the soup have the other flavors. And then this would be something that would be kind of easy to actually like take a bite of or dip in a little bit, the side, like the extra breading. Overall, it is really good. That's a little more insight about the flavor profile we've got going on. Next up, we are heading northeast to Maryland with crab cakes. 
For Maryland, we are making crab cakes. I didn't want to just boil crab and eat it as is because we've already done that with Alaskan king crab and with lobster. So I wanted to just switch it up a little bit and do something different, but I knew it had to involve crab because crab in Maryland are just kind of like that. It's very straightforward. It's just a handful of ingredients, including the all important crab meat. You mix it all together, let it chill for 30 minutes, and then you form it into patties and you bake it. It's very simple and I'm very happy with the fact that it is baked and not fried because I can't do fried food that much anymore. And I don't like frying it myself because it makes me nervous. I'm gonna go ahead, reposition you so you can watch us mix everything together. And then I'll catch up to you when we are forming the patties. In the late 19th century, crab was not very popular in dishes on the East Coast, although it was easy to access because the art of catching the crabs and extracting the meat was not yet mastered. Once that was figured out, however, crab meat became very popular in dishes. Blue crabs were most common, especially in Maryland, and soon became a staple in the state. Crab cakes were created to cater to more people while using bread and filler helped reduce the fishy taste of the crab. All right, it has been 30 minutes. So now I'm gonna take our half cup measurement. I'm gonna scoop it out like so and put it there. And I'm going to scoop out all of these. It's supposed to make six. Dan's doing the dishes in the background. That's why there's water and clanking and everything else happening. That's his dishes sung. So now it says do not flatten, just kind of shape into decent presentable lumps. So that's what we're doing. All right, and then the last step is we take some melted butter and brush it all over the tops. And into the oven it goes. Ta-da! All right, moment of truth. Definitely smell crabby. Tastes crabby too. Butter's definitely a good idea. Mm -hmm. It's not bad. No. But it's mushier than I expected it to be. Mm -hmm. It's still moist on the inside. Mm -hmm. It was really good. Yeah, we left it in the oven longer than what the recipe called for by about six minutes. Eight minutes, actually. It just to make sure the tops got browned because they weren't getting browned. But we were also cooking potatoes in the oven at the same time, so that probably had something to do with it. Not bad. Mm -mm. I'm not a huge crab person in general, so I don't know if I'd really gravitate toward this normally, but... Maybe if we lived in Maryland. Right. I think overall it's pretty good. Mm-hmm. Very much nice lobster. Still wrong about that lobster. Of course I am. We're disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> Jumping over to the west, we are cooking for Colorado and making the slopper. The slopper. I'm going into this recipe with about as much hope as I had for, or, well, I'm going into this recipe with about as much apprehension as I did when we made Kentucky hot brown. That I did not anticipate coming out good, and it was amazing. So I'm hoping that this does the same. Basically what the slopper is, it is a burger essentially swimming in chili, but not your normal type of chili because there's not hamburger in the chili, there's pork shoulder in the chili, cut in cubes. So this is very, very different. So it is currently about 20 to four in the afternoon. I'm wanting to eat about 6.30, but I'm starting now because this, this chili, once we get it going, it has to simmer for almost two, for, for two to three hours. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. It called for two Serrano peppers, which I've gotten here, 12 large, green peppers, not bell pepper, but like green chili peppers. So it said like poblano peppers. These are poblano peppers. They're massive. I got three when I was at Walmart because I didn't want to walk out with 
a truck full of these things like a lunatic. So I got three and jalapenos is what I got the rest of because I knew if I got lots of jalapenos, we would use them up anyway. So the first step is the jalapenos and the poblanos we have to roast so we can get the skin off of them and then we can take the stem off and the seeds out after that. This is a new step for me. This is something I have not done in the past before. So what we are going to do is I have my entire stove top cleared off and we are going to turn the burners on, set them all on there and with these massive grill tongs that we have, we are going to just turn them until they are all nice and charred all around the whole pepper. Then we're gonna let it cool and then peel all the skin off of it. So it's kind of like an express sunburn. I am also gonna open doors and stuff because that's what mom suggested and it's actually a great idea. Cool, we shouldn't need to wash them because we're burning them. Exactly. The slopper is said to have originated in Pueblo, Colorado, in one of two restaurants. Both the Coors Tavern and the Star Bar lay claim to serving it first. One account says the slopper coined its name by a customer who said the dish looked like slop. Another account claims it was created by a patron who was tired of regular hamburgers and asked for a cheeseburger in a bowl smothered in green chili sauce. Okay, saw Dan working on the peppers. He is still working on them currently. He is now actually chopping them all up. I have been working on getting the pork shoulder all cut up, so that is diced. Now we just basically start assembling this, putting it all together, getting stuff cooked, and letting it simmer for two hours. Now that that has boiled, I turned it way down and basically I just have to keep stirring it for the next two hours. The next time you see us, it'll be in about an hour and a half when we make the burgers. Dan is currently working on cooking the burgers. Basically, once the burgers are done, all we have to do is assemble this and then eat it. Everything is done. So you can see we have the chili hanging out over here. We have all the burgers that we just made. We have our bowls that we're gonna assemble stuff. And we got the toppings, the onion and the cheese. And basically we're just gonna put it all together. And I'm already like, it's going against everything in my being to do this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Got a cheese. We need to put a little bit of chili on each one, which just, this just seems so wrong. And they get a top bun. Then they get a lot more chili. <sighs> uh. So, hello, more chili. Was this invented before pot was legalized in Colorado? <laughs> More chili. Oh my gosh, this is disgusting. I love it. All right, they need some onion for topper. And more cheese. Why am I eating a burger like this? Okay. Stab it all the way down there. Mm -hmm. I think I got some, yeah, there's some burger in there. <laughs> all right, are you ready? <laughs> okay. Oh, it's spicy. It's spicy. It's climbing. Mm hmm Why is it delicious? <laughs> Good question. I have video evidence that I was thinking or hoping that this would be like the Kentucky Hot Browns right. where I was like, this is gonna be disgusting and it turned out amazing. Thought the exact same thing. Did not expect it to be good, but hoped. And it's delicious. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, gl I'm glad we cut back the cream. Yeah, me too. <laughs> That's wonderful. That is wonderful. <laughs> It's very spicy. If you don't like spicy food, 100% not for you. It's not very spicy. Yeah. It's 
on the higher end of my spice tolerance, and I have a decent spice tolerance. It's just, it's, it's good. Yeah, <laughs> just good. It's really good. It's hearty. The bread isn't too like put offish because of how soggy it is now. So the, yeah, the cheese is good in there. Mm -hmm. There is really good flavor behind all of the spice. Like it's not just spice; it mm -hmm. is actually flavor as well. No. And then the chili was made with pork shoulder because you put it on top of a burger. You're getting that ground. You're getting that beef flavor in there as well. This is. <sighs> Really good. I, I'm kind of annoyed that it's good. Mm hmm. <laughs> Colorado, the slopper. Yep, keep slopping, baby. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> and finally, jumping back to the East Coast, we are cooking for New York and making a garbage plate. Garbage plate. It sounds disgusting. Depending on your food preferences, it might look disgusting but we are here to find out today if it tastes disgusting. If I have learned anything through this State Recipes series that I have done, it is that combining foods together stacked on top of each other that do not typically go together almost always turns out amazing, AKA hot brown, AKA the slopper that you just saw. So I have high hopes, especially considering Deconstructing this meal, everything sounds delicious and tastes delicious. Basically all it is, is potato, macaroni salad, you put a cheeseburger minus the bread on top of it, and then you have this homemade like meat sauce that you pour over the whole thing. And from what I've seen in the comments of the recipe that I am following is that a lot of places have their own version of this and they just don't call it garbage plate. They call it like leftover plate or whatever's left in the fridge plate. And this is just kind of what I have found is really well known for New York. So that is what we are cooking. As far as prep goes, like I said, everything deconstructed, again, is very, very simple. So the macaroni salad, I already have that made and in the fridge because that's incredibly simple to make. I didn't need to show it to you guys. The potatoes I have prepped in a bag right here that we're going to throw in the oven and bake. Very simple, didn't really need to show it to you guys. The burgers might show a little bit of that. The biggest thing though, sort of the signature of this dish is the Rochester hot sauce. That is the tomato meat sauce that's going on top of it. So I'm going to show you that. I have most of the things prepped on the counter right here, which I will go over in a second. That is sort of what brings this together as a garbage plate, if you will. So we're adding a little bit of oil into the pot and then we are going to cook up some garlic and onion. And after that gets cooked down a little bit, we are throwing in some hamburger meat to cook up. And finally this, sauce concoction that consists of a little bit of carrot, ground pepper, salt, tomato paste, mustard, brown sugar, cumin, chili powder, cayenne, and a little bit of beer. Okay. Here you go. Yeah. All right, so everything is done. We have the potatoes here, all nice and roasted. We have our Rochester hot sauce, which the hot refers to the temperature, not the spice level. Keep that in mind. We have our macaroni salad, and we have our burgers, along with some mustard and some fresh onion for topping. So basically all we have to do now is assemble it. The garbage plate was born in Rochester, New York at Nick Tahoe Hots. The earliest version of this dish goes back to 1918 when it was called Hots and Potatoes. The dish was essentially a plate piled with fried potatoes, baked beans, hot dogs, onions, mustard, and a chili-like meat sauce. Many years later, it was renamed the garbage plate after so many college students who would come in and ask for the plate with all the garbage on it. Alright, so to get a little bit of everything. <sighs> so 
like, where do you even start? Right. All right, and there's another one. Initial thought, there's a lot happening. There's a lot of very distinct flavors. Right. But then the more it sort of finished being in my mouth, it's a weird way of saying the more I chewed it and swallowed it, the more I kind of liked it. Yeah. The sauce has more of an actual spice kick than I think it was necessarily supposed to. There's definitely a spice there, and it's not meant to be spicy, but it also called for a lot of chili powder and cayenne. So I don't know why they were like, add all this cayenne pepper, but it's not spicy. Right. <laughs> it is. Right, right. But then the macaroni salad helps mitigate that. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. I don't know how I feel about the mustard on top. No? Mm -mm. I feel like it's just sort of a punch of flavor that I was getting used to everything else and then that hits and I'm like, what is going on? Mm -hmm. The flavors are good. Would I make this again? all of these again with the intention of piling them on top of each other on my plate? Probably not. I think everything would be also fine on its own. There's not much added by bringing everything together into a single dish rather than a simplified dish with sides of potatoes, macaroni salad, yada yada. Mm -hmm. It's not bad. <coughs> <laughs> you sure about that? <laughs> yeah, definitely not in our top favorite. Not terrible. On a scale of, it's okay, so we would definitely be adding this to our regular rotation of meals. Eh, it's more just on the it's okay. Mm -hmm. Still definitely gets a pass. So good job, New York. You know how to pile food on top of each other. Yep. I forget D minus is a pass. It's not a D minus. Don't pass. I mean, yeah. I'm just saying that doesn't, I don't know what that means. It's like, like a B minus. Okay, there you go. So those were the five states that we cooked for in this video. Let me know if you are from any of those states, what you think of how we handled these dishes, and if you have any recommendations on how we could have improved them, or if there were different dishes altogether that we should have cooked. Make sure to check out the other videos in this series so you can see how we cooked and served recipes from 25 other states that we have covered so far this being 26 through 30. And like I had said at the beginning of this video, all of the recipes to all of the meals that we cooked today are in the description box below, along with any alterations that we made to the recipes when we cooked them for the video. But like I said, I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. I hope you've had a good day and I hope you have a good day and I will see you in the next video. Bye.